Hello everyone. I hope you are doing great. Today we are going to have a summary of the book called 12 Rules for Life, written by Jordan B. Peterson and narrated by me, Abayagane. So, the introduction part. Wouldn't it be great if someone handed us a guide which explained very clearly what the rules of life were? Wouldn't that save us so much time and guesswork in trying to figure them out? Well, Jordan B. Peterson believes that a simple handbook of rules for life exists, or maybe at least now that he has written it, and there are only 12 of them. This summary will take you through Peterson's rules for living your best life and teach you some unexpected facts along the way. Through the course of this summary, you'll learn what lobsters can teach us about confidence, what flowers have to do with finding the meaning of life, and what skateboards can tell us about human nature. Interesting. So let's start. Chapter 1. Get to the top of the pecking order. You've heard of the phrase the pecking order, right? It is commonly used in the conversation, but do you know how it is originated? It was coined by a Norwegian zoologist named Iba, who was studying barnyard chickens during the 1920s and observed a clear hierarchy among the birds when it was feeding time. He noticed that the strongest, the healthiest chickens ate first and forced the sick or shy ones to wait until there were only scraps left. This, of course, guaranteed that the strong chickens retained their advantage while their counterparts only grew weaker. The same is true with other species of animals as well. Lobsters, for example, exhibit similar behaviors if they've been raised in captivity or in the wild, proving that their sense of the pecking order is innate rather than a learned behavior. In fact, scientists have observed that lobsters instigate aggressive fights to compete for the best shelter spots and that this actually alters their biology. For instance, Venus possess a stronger level of serotonin octopamine, while the ratio is Reduce for lobsters who commonly lose this means that the hormone advantage caused winning lobsters to stay stronger and healthier, in addition to exhibiting a more confident posture. By contrast, their counterparts became more timid and curled up out of fear, and as you've probably observed, this behavior is frequently mimicked by humans as well. People who frequently win at life become emboldened by their winning streak, and this causes them to pursue new challenges with confidence. In fact, that confidence is often what enables them to generate further success. Likewise, those who are in the grip of depression or feel that life is never in their favor are more risk averse and tend to approach each situation as through they already know they will fail. This, in return, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that reinforces their bleak worldview. So, if you are trying to get ahead in life and enjoy it, try to think like a lobster. Strike that confident pose to tell people you are a winner and keep faking it until you make it. Chapter 2. Love yourself as you would others. At first, that saying might sound like it is reversed. After all, isn't it supposed to love others as you would yourself? But while that is definitely the common expression, it is reversed for our purpose. Because often we are better at caring for others than we are for ourselves. That is because we are often hyper aware of our own flaws and this awareness can lead to self-loathing as we dwell on all the reasons we believe ourselves to be inferior 
we become convinced that we are undeserving of self-care, self-love, kindness, or positivity. Because of this, we tend to focus all our positive energy on those we love, especially our partners and pets, and neglect to give ourselves the same passion. Eastern philosophy acknowledges these toxic patterns through its teaching on the duality of the nature. The yin-yang symbol represents the dark side and a light side, with the implications being that each side contains at least a hint of the other and neither can exist without the other. Eastern philosophy also places that harmony can only be achieved by embracing both and searching out healthy balance between the two. This balance can be attained by avoiding extremes and illustrated by an example of a parent and their child. Let's say that a parent only wanted the best for the child and was desperate to prevent them from experiencing anything bad, unhealthy. However, if they were to go too far in shielding their child, and thus prevent them from learning about the world or exploring new experiences, they would hurry towards an opposite extreme rather than being protected from negative influences. Their child would simply feel stifled and might rebel in more extreme ways to regain a sense of freedom. Neither of these extremes are healthy, so as you seek balance in your own life, remember to not to go too far towards the dark side or to go overboard in an attempt at perfection. It is impossible to be perfect and chaos is inevitable. So don't waste your time and energy fighting the unavoidable. It is also important that you do not focus only on the things that make you happy. While that might be more fun to pursue only the things that give you warm, fuzzy feeling of joy inside, it also won't cultivate a personal growth. So, focus instead on what's best for you in the same way as a loving parent would do, what's best for their children. A child might not want to eat their vegetables or go to bed on time, but their parent ensures they do because it is healthy for them. So, in your adult life, recognize, identify your life's purpose and direction and then make healthy and smart decisions that will help you achieve that goal. Chapter 3. Choose your friends wisely. Have you ever noticed that the things your friends say slip into your own vocabulary before you even notice? It is no surprise because the more time you spend around people, the more they rub off on you. And while picking up your friend's speech patterns might be harmless, it might be time to get consent if you notice your friend's toxic habits and traits are influencing you as well. Because we often choose our friends through superficial criteria like common interests or a shared sense of humor, we don't always pause to reconsider exactly what kind of person our best buddy is, nor do we always reflect on the effects toxic habits can have on our own personal development. But negative people and bad life decisions have a scary ability to drag successful people down, and unfortunately, that effect can occur just as easily in the professional sphere as in your personal life. For example, many bosses and managers and professionals consider that putting an underachiever on a group project with high performance will build that person up and encourage them to emulate their counterparts' best practices. However, Studies have shown that the opposite effect is actually more highly likely and the successful teammates will be brought down and dragged down by the negative influence. And that's why it is so vital that we surround ourselves with positive and energetic people who actively cultivate good habits 
in their lives. A good friend won't allow you to wallow in self-pity or engage in negative self-talk, and they'll call you out when they see you are developing toxic behaviors, and in turn, you will do the same for them, because you are both seeking to improve yourselves in the world around you. Your friendship will literally help you both become your most amazing selves. So, choose your friends wisely. Chapter 4 Be your own personal best How often do you catch yourself comparing your success in relation to that of others? Whether it is with the intent to build yourself up with statements like, well, at least I did better than she did, or to discard yourself with such comments as, I'll never win that award like she did. This thought pattern is beyond toxic. That is because comparison is a killer of progress. Mark this, please. As such, it is important to clarify here that comparison and self-criticism are not the same thing. Self-criticism is healthy to a degree because it encourages you to actively take stock of your flaws and identify areas where you can improve. This is what motivates us to work towards a brighter, more successful future. But self-criticism takes an ugly turn when it is distorted by the lens of comparison. Because instead of asking ourselves what we can do to improve upon our own personal best, comparison causes us to measure and calculate ourselves by the standards of others. This view eliminates the moments of incremental growth that shape our journeys along the way, replacing our progress with a black and white filter of either success or failure. And if we find that we don't measure up to others, it does remain that we failed, but nothing could be further from the truth. Because if we were to take a step back and look at the big picture, we would be able to clearly see every part of ourselves and acknowledge the small personal milestones that define our growth as individuals. Sure, maybe your coworker got that promotion instead of you, but maybe instead of prioritizing your career, you are developing your relationship with your family because that is what was right for you. So, stop comparing yourself to others and instead judge yourself against your prior accomplishments. Are you better today than you were yesterday? Do you want to be better tomorrow than you were today? If the answer is yes, and it should be, then this is the secret to keeping yourself on the right track. Because when you compare your present to your past, you'll recognize that you're growing in the ways that are right for you at the best speed that suits you best. You'll be able to acknowledge those small moments of growth that are critical in the development of your best self, and you'll be able to appreciate the unique and extraordinary aspects of your life that make your progress specific to you. So, evaluate your personal progress only by the standards that are applicable to you and as you take stock of your development think of yourself as a home inspector just like a home inspector you'll analyze everything from bottom to top determining whether a problem is a cosmetic fix or a structural flaw make a list of everything you find that needs to be improved and then attack it, renovating yourself the same way you would a house. The best part is that when you are so focused on becoming the person you need to be, you will not have the time to think of comparing yourself to others. Chapter 5. Raise a kind and responsible child. The right way to raise our children is one of life's biggest quandaries and it torments a lot of parents as they struggle to get it right. 
because our children come into the world as blind as you might imagine. We are often paralyzed by the question of what to write on the people who will impact future generations. It is suggested that the starting point for answering this question is to acknowledge innate human aggression. We all know how nasty kids can be to each other. Pretty much everyone has a bullying story from at least one person in their childhood. So, what if our primary concern was simply raising kind kids? It is asserted that cultivating kindness requires more than being a friend to your child. In fact, successful parenting demands taking the risk that there may be times when your child doesn't like you. Although that might sting a little, take a moment to consider how this style of parenting would pay out. After all, if you are focused on being your child's best friend forever, you are not focused on enforcing rules. Rather, your job is to ensure that they are only ever happy and having fun, and that's not going to help your child become a well-adjusted and likable adult. So, while it might not be fun to set boundaries and enforce them, it might help to remember that you are doing your child a great service by teaching them life lessons early on at an early age. After all, isn't it better for them to learn responsibility from a loving parent than from a society that will teach them in a far less gentle way? So, if you are eager to help your child become the best they can be, here are some top tips for successful parenting that have been suggested. The first tip is to avoid limiting the rules. While rules are absolutely necessary, if you have too many, your child will become frustrated and feel as they are surrounded by obstacles. So, instead of controlling their lives, minimize the number of rules. Like, your socks always have to match or you must always be in bed by 8 o'clock. Focus on practical real-world rules, like showing respect, being kind, never using violence. Remember that these rules will help shape your child's core values. And honestly, would you rather have a child who's loving and respectful or a little monster whose socks always match? The next rule is to always use the least amount of force necessary. So, make sure you set clear rules with equally clear consequences and take care to make the punishment fit the crime. Knowing which punishments will be most effective for helping your child learn the consequences of their actions also requires an in-depth knowledge of your child. So, get to know the unique person they are and understand when only a verbal correction is vital and when to take away video games for a week. And the third tip is to stand as a united front. If you are a two-parent household, make sure you let your child know that they can't pitch you to against each other to get their own way. Likewise, be sure to support your partner even when they make mistakes. Lovingly acknowledging mistakes and working on them together is a key to growth and a happy home. Number 6. Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. How is someone supposed to set themselves in perfect order? This kind of question misses the entire point to some extent. The idea is not that you must live perfectly, but that you must be willing to deeply examine your life and your choices in order to prevent future mistakes. Basically, stop doing things that are objectively bad for you or that you know to be a bad idea. For example, this could be stopping smoking or drinking alcohol a lot or maybe letting go of a toxic relationship. Don't rush to judge and blame others for the problems of the world. 
I think this step can be summed up in one beautifully said quote. The world can be a better place if we start building it from our own homes. Chapter 7 Seek sacrifice over instant gratification You've probably witnessed the human being's temptation to pursue what we want even when it will lead to negative consequences. It is a pretty universal experience, but giving in to that desire doesn't really make us better people, does it? Unfortunately, we can easily relate to this as we naturally prefer to opt for the more instant and delightful option, not the more beneficial and healthy one. If we view the world as bleak and miserable, we naturally seek to alleviate our depression by pursuing any pleasure that will make our existence more bearable. This often leads to the justification that something can't be wrong if it makes us happy and that type of rationalization can be getaway to very unhealthy decisions. So, how can we combat this? Peterson suggests our best action plan is to pursue sacrifice over instant gratification. That is because sacrifice puts better things into the future through relinquishing instant pleasure in the present and we sort of know that already. After all, we sacrifice things we'd rather be doing to go to work every day and earn a living, but that type of sacrifice is still in the interest of personal gain, because we do it to facilitate our own survival or save for the promise of a vacation later on. However, Peterson argues that the true sacrifice, the type we need to follow in order to become kinder, happier, and more well-adjusted people, is defined by the things we do for others. So, instead of pursuing selfish instant pleasures, consider giving up a bit of your time to volunteer and make a difference in someone else's life. When you concentrate on the good things you can put into the world, you take a break from your negative worldview and allow yourself to be driven by positive influences. You might find it helpful to think of the lotus flower as an inspiration. This plant starts its life at the bottom of a muddy lake and slowly rises to the top in small increments of growth until it bursts through the water to blossom in the sun. You can experience the same type of growth by prioritizing sacrifices for the good of others over instant gratification for yourselves. Because selflessness not only reinvents your worldview, it makes you a better person, which is beneficial for the whole world. Chapter 8. Stop lying even to yourself. We all tend to lie to ourselves in one way or another. Whether it is by telling ourselves we are going to meet a certain goal without putting any effort towards it, or in deluding ourselves about our flaws, we are all lawyers. The Austrian psychologist Alfred Adler called this habit life-wise and defined them as the things we say and do to get what we think we want. That distinction what we think we want is important because it acknowledges the fact that we often trick ourselves into craving things that ultimately aren't good for us. The same is true for our ability to convince ourselves that we already know everything we need to know. This is an especially insidious lie because if we assume we already have the right tools for self-improvement, we lose all willingness to learn and grow. So, the author's eight rule of living is stop lying and tell yourself the truth. Own your self-awareness and learn to recognize when you are telling yourself one of those life lies and then work to fix it. Realigning your goals and your personal truth can help you get your life back on track and be honest about your progress. Chapter 9. 
engage in healthy debate. If you spend any time on social media at all, you know it can often be a hotbed of conflict and criticism. If you spend any time on social media at all, you know it can often be a hotbed of conflict and criticism. People often take offense far too quickly and lash out by hateful things at random strangers on the internet. This behavior has regrettably come to characterize the state of conversation in our society and is an utter perversion of what healthy debate used to mean. Reclaiming your ability to engage in genuine conversation requires returning to the truths of ancient Greek philosophers who understood that respectfully challenging someone's idea is not the same as attacking that person. Following this method taps into Peterson's ninth life lesson, which is to listen to what others have to say and consider that you have something to learn from them. Instead of treating your conversation as a competition, looking for opportunities to prove that you are right and the other person is wrong, or looking for reasons to take offense, simply focus on listening. You might disagree with someone else's idea, and that's completely okay. Even in those cases, you should still approach all conversations by following the simple method of listening, and then summarize to recap what you have heard out loud. Rephrasing what you understood in your own words is a very great and powerful way to communicate with the other person and to ensure that you heard them correctly. It also shows that you care to truly hear and take in what they are saying. Chapter 10. Confront complexity with clarity. It is no secret that life can be confusing and our relationships with others can sometimes be even more complicated. However, we can alleviate part of that confusion by acknowledging that sometimes the reason we fail to understand things is because we only pay attention to the details that interest or make sense to us. And while that's a natural human inclination, after all, we are not physically capable of thinking of everything all the time. Our inability to see the big picture can often make the world feel extra chaotic. That is why we need Rule 10. Use precise language. Confronting the world's complexities with the clarity of precise language is invaluable because it helps us to break down complex concepts into simple, bite-sized nuggets of information that we can understand by simplifying the situation through precise terminology we can establish order in our lives, whether the issue lies in our car breaking down or our body is getting sick. By specifically articulating symptoms, we can start to take back control. The same is true of conflict in relationships. If your feelings are hurt or you're seeking to tackle an issue of your partner's, precise language can help you articulate the problem in a simple, honest manner. Chapter 11. Avoid suppressing human nature. As today's society attempts to correct a culture of injustice, it can be difficult to know where the lines are. Our effort to combat the ills of toxic masculinity sometimes leads people to stigmatize men and masculinity altogether. And that should not be the answer, while it is extremely true that men have behaved deplorably for centuries and used their power to manipulate, stigmatize, and discriminate against women. People of color and many other groups of people we shouldn't unfairly direct our sense of outrage at all men. This worldview leads to destroying rather than fixing a problem or creating a solution, and that shouldn't be the aim of social justice. Instead, we should concentrate on blending our differences to achieve a harmonious future because many men, just like 
Women are aggressive and dominant by nature, and those traits don't have to be a bad thing when they are directed in the right path with encouragement and guidance on how to avoid becoming part of the problem men can channel those personality traits into accomplishing amazing things that contribute to the greater good of society in order to elaborate on that the author considers the example of skateboarders he once noticed that on the grounds of the University of Toronto campus, some young skateboarders were demonstrating amazing feats of agility and balance. However, because social norms often categorize skateboarding as undesirable, the city officials decided to ban skateboarding on their campus. This policy failed to consider the teen's dedication and willingness to embrace physical risk and instead criminalize their behavior. The author argued that this was a huge mistake and suggested that the same is true of any instance where we vilify a certain group of people instead of holistically stigmatizing one group as illustrated by such statements as all men are trash, we should be willing to embrace new perspectives and talents that are different from our own. Ultimately, that is the worldview which should drive our society, because it invites us to make rules that protect us without suppressing the good qualities that different people can bring to the table. That is why life lesson number 11 is don't bother young skateboarders. So whether it is skateboarding or men being persistent and aggressive, we shouldn't criminalize behavior unless it is actively hurting someone else, because then it really is a part of the problem. Chapter 12. Celebrate the little things. We've already mentioned how life can be full of sorrow, but it is important to remember that life is also full of joy. The key difference is that where sadness often threatens to confuse us by smacking us in the face, we have to look a little bit harder to find joy. Peterson knows this personally because his daughter has a health issue since she was six years old, and this disease has filled her childhood with extreme pain, frequent injections, and multiple invasive surgeries to replace her entire joints. If you are reading this and feeling that life is unfair, you're right. There is nothing fair about an innocent child suffering so much pain, but the author has said the darkness of these moments should only strengthen our motivation to seek out the good in life. That is why rule number 12 is make the best out of even the smallest joys that life has to show. In his own experience, Peterson has discovered that relentless positivity is the only way to sustain yourself through even the darkest of times, because although he is deeply affected by his daughter's suffering, he is grateful that after years of pain and sorrow, she finally found a doctor who was able to help her achieve greater mobility and develop a life with a lot more normalcy and a lot less pain. Although he knows she is not fully out of the woods yet and that more complications may arise down the road, he is grateful for the small mercies in her life and seeks to keep them both positive to that end. He advises readers to always avoid getting bogged down by sadness and sorrow and keep an eye out for even the little things that can make you happy, like petting a random fluffy cat you meet on a walk. I hope you have enjoyed the summary of this book and I will be more than happy to have you on this channel. Take care.